Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for October 6, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. This is the City Council Update and I am pleased to be joined once again by Councilor Ben Ewan Campen, Ward 3 Councilor, City of Somerville. Ben, beautiful October afternoon. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Joe. Thank you very much for having me. Nice to see you. Um, Councilor McLaughlin has, has entrusted you with 27 minutes of uninterrupted airtime. You're doing something right, Ben. I am looking forward to this just absolute and total filibuster for 27. <laughs> um, we do have, I, I'm glad you're doing well. We do have some uh, serious topics to talk about today, mainly centered around uh, COVID, housing, and redevelopment. Uh, but first, I wanted to give the brief update. You and I were talking before the show. Um, the COVID pandemic continues its slow and steady march. Uh, there are some concerning signals that that disease is giving off, which is it is back on the upswing. Um, we've noticed across the country that there are now probably 21 to 23 states that have entered back into a red zone, meaning it is spreading and it's spreading quick. Here in Massachusetts, we have a number of municipalities who have now entered into the red zone, including the capital city of Boston. Um, Somerville so far holding slightly steady, um, but as I said to somebody, you know, these, these infectious droplets don't know a border of a city. So we are surrounded at this point by communities that have gone into the red in the past week. Not a good sign for what's about to come in the winter time, Ben. No, Joe, and I think that um, you know we're really lucky here in Somerville. Um, the community has stepped up in an un incredible way. Um, the the mask wearing, the social distancing, people have been taking that really seriously. I think we're also really lucky in local government. We have this incredible um, data team, and most weeks the city council we have a meeting where we get an update of you know every way you can slice and dice the COVID data, and. You know, I, I think one thing that is becoming clear is as we just grind on week after week, month after month into this, all of us, I think there, you run a risk of your eyes kind of glazing over. You know, the data, it's, it can be really overwhelming to take in. And I think it's important for everyone to understand that although Somerville is right now, I think in a, a, a relatively good place and people are behaving well, it's important to recognize that across the state, um, the, the positivity rate is increasing. Um, and it does not take much to imagine starting an outbreak. Um, and the, the, the take home message that all of us need to just never, never forget is that this is not over, it's not even close to over. And wash your hands, socially distance, stay home when you can. Um, it, it, it gets harder and harder each week. Um, uh, and yet, you know, this is what we have to do to keep each other safe. And so I'm incredibly thankful to everyone that has been taking this so seriously, both in the community and in the local government. Um, but I think it is important that we don't let our eyes glaze over and that we, we do pay attention to what's going on, especially as parts of the state start to reopen even more, despite the fact that we're seeing an uptick. Um, it is time to be, to be extra careful. Agreed. And the thing that I keep in the forefront of my mind, Ben, is people are mobile. We are still mobile. We may not know that we're infected with the virus. And if we move from one community to another, we're taking it with us. So um, I want to go into a couple of things that, that you had signaled to me that you wanted to talk about. One is the affordable housing overlay. The other is the redevelopment of the Winter Hill Star Market site. And the other is the Somerville Cares Fund report. Those all kind of dovetail, Ben, one into another. So I'm just gonna let you take it away in terms of how you wanna craft this and I may have some questions. Please, yes. So thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity. So I, I wanna talk um, about my top priority legislatively on the city council right now, which is what's called the Citywide Affordable Housing Overlay District, which is a bit jargony. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to walk folks through it. Um, but before I do that, I actually kind of want to zoom out a little bit and talk about what is going on right now in housing in Massachusetts. And that is that the eviction moratorium that we have in Massachusetts is currently set to expire on October 17th. 
So I don't need to tell anyone here, we are in the midst of a pandemic. There are thousands of families in Somerville and across the state who have had their incomes slashed in half, who have had their livelihoods turned upside down. The only thing that has kept uh, our heads above water and that has kept a lot of these families from being kicked out on the street is that we currently have a statewide eviction moratorium. Um, as of right now, that is set to expire on October 17th. The estimates, you know, it's hard to get precise numbers, but the estimates are between 20,000 and 80,000 Massachusetts families could face eviction if that happens. We don't have exact numbers for Somerville, but I, I've seen estimates from some of our nonprofit housing agencies. They're, they're currently aware of close to 1,000 families who have lost more than half of their income and you can imagine would almost certainly face eviction under those circumstances. This is as the winter is just beginning and the pandemic is still ongoing. Um, what's really frustrating is that Governor Baker, um, had, when asked if, if he would consider extending the, the moratorium, uh, he signaled that he is ready to let it um, lapse. And he, he was quoted in a story um, as saying that he thinks the courts can handle it now as if the courts handling it is the issue that anyone cares about. The, the um, courts, so, I'm sorry, Ben, the courts that are not fully up to speed operating. Yeah, right. So picture, close your eyes and picture thousands of evictions happening over Zoom in the middle of a winter in a pandemic. That's what we're talking about. Um, the, the, the ray of hope is that there is a bill in the legislature right now. It is called the Guaranteed Housing Stability Act. It is co-sponsored by Somerville Representative Mike Connolly and a number of others. Um, it now has close to 90 co-sponsors. This would not only preserve the eviction moratorium, but it would also take a lot of really important steps beyond that. It would freeze rents and cancel mortgage foreclosures for a year after the emergency ends. It would create a number of legal protections for tenants and for small property owners. And it would create a fund to assist property owners who have seen a drop in income. Um, it is an all hands on deck effort to get this bill passed. And so this week, we are actually calling it the Homes for All Week of Action, um, where we're making sure that people are aware of this deadline, making sure that everyone out there, if you haven't already, call your state rep, call your state senator, call the governor. This is a must pass bill. Um, and if you want more information about this, you should go to housingguaranteed.org, where you can sign up for. Um, for updates and you know to get involved in the activism, I, I think it's really important to recognize this is not business as usual. We are not in a normal legislative uh, session here in Massachusetts. We are on the precipice of what you know housing experts have called a tsunami of evictions. And if you talk to any grassroots organizations that work on housing, this is issue number one, two, three, four, five. You know this is the top issue right now for from everyone that they're representing. Um, so I raise that just because I think this is a time where if you care about housing justice, economic justice, this is a time where we need to play defense against the eviction moratorium ending and against the pandemic. But the affordable housing overlay district, this is a policy in Somerville where we can start to play offense. And what I mean by that is it is within our power on the city council to take a bunch of really important steps to actually make it easier to create more affordable housing in Somerville. Um, and, you know, I think affordable housing can, you can, it's very easy to get drawn into the weeds on different policy specifics. But to me, the basic idea of this, if you want Somerville to be a diverse place to live, where you don't have to be wealthy to live here and raise a family here, um, we need to create more affordable housing, period. Ben, I do want to talk about it in depth, but I have a couple of questions on the first part that you were talking about, the moratorium expiration. How serious do you think the governor is about letting this lapse? Uh, I take him at his word. You know, I take the governor at his word um, that he is absolutely ready to, to, to let the market try to handle what's about to happen. And Rep Conley is one of the lead sponsors of a bill that would prevent the catastrophic uh, results of him letting that deadline lapse. How soon can that get enacted? How soon can it get funded? And how soon can we get money out into the hands of people who need it? So I'm not going to pretend to be able to read the tea leaves on the, the Massachusetts state legislature. What I would say is uh, we need action on this and a number of other um, 
uh, policies that have been held up in the state legislature. And, uh, you know, to be fair, I think state legislatures around the country are waiting for a signal from the federal government that help is on the way. So, uh, you know, I I do want to be really clear that states cannot solve this, these problems on their own. But that said, the eviction moratorium, you know, that's something we need to do months ago. Um, no then, one should need to live with that kind of uncertainty in this, in this situation, agreed. but you're not going to have shelter. Agreed. I always, I try to get the technical or the factual side in play in my head. Didn't uh, Mayor Curtitoni and the council institute their own eviction moratorium here in Somerville? Thank you for bringing that up. So currently in Somerville, under the state of an emergency, there is an eviction moratorium at the local level. And, you know, I I haven't spoken in the last week to the mayor, but I I would assume that we will keep that in place. But I think um, it's really important that the city and the state are in lockstep about what the legal protections are so the tenants don't have to worry about, well, if there's one in this city, but not in this, uh, not at the state, you know, I that level of uncertainty is not going to benefit people who have fear about what's happening with their with their home. And just to make sure I understood it, what what Charlie Baker's um, uh, eviction moratorium was covering, it also lend lended a hand to the mortgage holder themselves. Uh, that there was some slight assistance being given to them to tell the banks to back off and stop and don't try to foreclose on the properties because the tenants couldn't pay the rent. So the the Housing Stability Act, the bill that is now pending, would expand a lot of those protections for small property owners and would make it uh, you know, much, much, much more difficult for people to get foreclosed on for, for lack of payment. Okay. The basic idea being, we are collectively trying to live through a pandemic here. This is not the time for people to be making a huge profit in the real estate market, right? This is a time for us to support one another and for the government to step in and say, um, no one is going to wind up on the streets because of a pandemic. So uh, I'm sorry, I I had to kind of clarify the dates in my head and who was doing what. So on the affordable housing overlay, you've been working on it for quite a while on council. So if you want to take it again, one. Absolutely. So the, the, the citywide affordable housing overlay district, this is, has been a priority of the council um, before the pandemic. I, I think it's only now, uh, it's even more important that we get it done. So, so the basic idea is this. Um, I believe at the local level, there is no way that any city council in the country could solve the affordable housing crisis. We, we have tools at our disposal, but the underlying kind of economic inequalities that lead to the housing crisis, we can't tackle that. That said, we do have tools within our power. And, you know, President McLaughlin, he always says, uh, grant the city council the, uh, <laughs> the courage to change what we can change, the wisdom to accept what we uh, cannot change and the wisdom to understand the difference between the two. And the affordable housing overlay district is something where the power is in our hands. And what this is, it's a zoning tool that will do two things. For one, it says, if you are going to build an 100% affordable housing development in Somerville, we're gonna streamline the legal and procedural process to give you more certainty um, when you're going around to various funders that you know you'll be able to build this project. And the other thing it does is it, it actually incentivizes this type of project by saying on a given piece of property, if you're building 100% affordable, you can build a building that's a little larger. And so, for example, if you're in an area where a market rate, you know, a luxury developer would be able to build three or four stories, you might be able to build seven or eight stories. If you're in a, a district that would allow you to build, you know, a two, three family house, maybe you could put an extra story on it, uh, outbuilding in the backyard, things like that. And the reason that is so important is 100% affordable developers are out there competing with market rate developers. Of course, the market rate developers can turn around and sell their homes for you know, $1.8 million, rent them for $4,500 a month today in Somerville, whereas an affordable developer obviously can't do that at the end. So to, to level the playing field a little bit, we're saying if you are going to build 100% affordable housing, you can actually build more of it, which makes it, it levels the playing field financially. And, and the reason I'm not giving exact numbers on this is because we're actually still working on the details in the city council. And of course, this will have you know, a, a public hearing and people will be able to weigh in. I think the details are important, but the concept underlying it is pretty straightforward. As m- my colleague Lance Davis said, when we first started talking about that, 
we want the, the legislative equivalent of if you're going to build 100% affordable housing, go for it. And so this is something that um, the, a number of our neighboring communities have, have looked at. So Cambridge actually last night passed one. There, it, it took several years of, of deliberation. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that that will not be the case in Somerville, that we'll be able to move this quickly. Um, Boston has started to look at this as well. Ben, let me see if I get the concept correct in my head. If you're going to build 100% affordable housing, which is desperately needed, we're going to make it very easy for you to do that. And if you are a private developer and you exceed what we expect on your affordable housing units, we're going to give you density. Is that basically the deal? Um, almost. So the deal, so what we're working on now exclusively applies to 100% affordable housing buildings. So um, for a normal, normal market rate development in Somerville, if you're over six units, 20% of the units uh, have to be affordable units set aside. We're, we're not really touching that policy. Okay. You, you could imagine that there's a kind of, well, if you go to 30%, you get this. If you go to 40%, you get this. We did a number, a lot of outreach research with market rate developers. And basically what, what they came back with was it's going to be basically impossible to get above 20. Maybe we could get to 30, but you'd need to give us a lot. So where we're at in the conversation is let's focus on 100% affordable buildings um, because, you know, to me, that's a, it's just so night and day. This is something that we desperately need in Somerville and we want to do everything in our power to just say, if, you ha if you're a, a nonprofit developer and you have a project that you think can work in Somerville, we're not going to be the people that stand in the way. In, as part of your proposal, Ben, do you have uh, some conditions in there in terms of where these 100% affordable housing units are going to be built or developments? I mean, have you parsed it out and said you cannot congregate all of these along one part of the city Broadway, for instance? You oh, sure. Right. So I, I think it, it is important. And I know that, you know, there is a concern because of, you know, a, a long history of <laughs> bad housing policy in America that, um, you know, we're going to create parts of the city where it's all, where affordable housing is concentrated and others where it's not. Um, it, I personally believe that that will not be an issue with this policy whatsoever. So this is a district, um, what we call an overlay district, but in fact, it covers the whole city. And it says, um, you can build these uh, affordable projects anywhere. Um, and depending on what would normally be allowed, that's what really scales uh, how big the project can be. So you can't build a skyscraper on a parcel that would normally get, you know, a two family house. Um, but if you're in a commercial district, if you're along a corridor, that's where we're going to see apartment buildings, um, larger apartment buildings. Um, and if you're on, you know, what we call the neighborhood residence streets, um, the kind of smaller streets throughout Somerville, there, there will be more modest size increases. And, you know, I, I will say that um, currently, the thing that really limits the construction of new affordable housing is funding. Everybody knows that, right? This is you, in order to build 100% affordable projects, you need public money. And if you look, I don't know if anyone uh, watching followed the process around the Clarendon, um, which has been a, a huge project, which was recently approved by the zoning board to, to redevelop um, uh, between two and 300 um, affordable units. If you look at the, the, the different funding sources that they had to put together to make that thing work, it is really hard. And that is because the federal government used to fund affordable housing and they basically don't anymore. So ben, now- I, I want to yeah. put that project into, I want to put that development into context for somebody who may not know what, sure. what Clarendon is. In the old Somerville vernacular, um, and you know I grew up here, we always refer to that as the projects at North Street. So quite frankly, it is a public-private partnership that is rehabilitating and expanding the entire former public housing complex up there at Clarendon Hill um, behind the cemetery. Um, uh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, thank you. You know, I, I actually, I think it's a really exciting project and the way that it's working is that all, all of the units that were there are getting rebuilt. And in addition to that, about an equal number of market rate units are being built, plus, I believe, 70 what they call kind of workforce housing units, which are targeted 
to be sort of, uh, you know, for people who make about the area median income. Um, you know, I, I think that there are probably still some people who have, uh, um, you know, who, who view a stigma about public housing buildings. And I will just say for my generation, for people that I know, um, that's not what public housing, that stigma I don't think should exist. I honestly feel like it doesn't really exist anymore. I think, you know, I, I lived on Warren Ave for several years, right across the street from a, a Somerville Housing Authority building. Some stigma to that, they were my neighbors, you know, there, there's no problem whatsoever in the neighborhood, you know, they're just wonderful neighborhood building like any other building. No, but I, think, I think you hit the nail on the head, Ben, it is a generational change. I think that, you know, there is um, the, the housing crisis has gotten to a point that for anyone who is trying to find a place to rent in Somerville, for anyone who's looking to buy a house, you know, if you're not already wealthy, it's a joke. And it, it's just very clear that the private market is not solving this issue. It's not even coming, it's making it worse. And the city needs to take proactive steps, I think, to, um, to make it, uh, to create more affordable housing. Let's go into, um, it's a segue into where are we going to develop these housing? And you, you touched on it before, you know, in the commercial corridors. Winter Hill, the All Star Market site, is one such big parcel of land. Can you give us kind of the clip notes on what you're working on and what is going to be redeveloped there? Absolutely. So anyone who lives in Somerville knows the abandoned star market up on Broadway. And uh, this has just been a huge frustration for the city for, for many, many years. And uh, quite recently, the city took a proactive step to say, we're going to take control of this site and we are going to decide as a community what we want to have happen there. So the Winter Hill Neighborhood Association, uh, Ward 4 City Councilor Jesse Klingen, um, this project's in Ward 4, and State Rep Christine Barber did a lot of community organizing and working with the city have now put together what's called a renewal plan. And in order for this to actually take effect in Somerville, it needs to be approved by a body called the Redevelopment Authority, Somerville Redevelopment Authority. And I actually, uh, the city council took a big step a few years ago that I believe we did not get enough credit for, which is we passed a law that says going forward, we need a city councilor on the Somerville Redevelopment Authority. This is a body that has enormous powers. They, could, they can use eminent domain. They oversee a lot of the big developments in the city. And we need an elected voice on this, on this appointed body. So I've been serving in that role for the last few years. Um, and you know what, what I'm trying to do and what the city council is trying to do is bring transparency to this process and try to build public trust around that. And I, I believe that we've done, um, honestly, an excellent job around the Winter Hill Project where I think there is enormous community support um, to, to take control of that site and for us to, to decide what's gonna happen there. So earlier this can summer- the reason that, Ben? Can we yeah. use the word eminent domain? Certainly. Yeah, that, that's on the table. So the, the redevelopment authority is the body in Somerville that has the uh, legal authority to use eminent domain. In, in the case of Star Market, it's not clear that we will have to do that. It, we might be able to work with the property owners and um, to, to make the community's vision happen otherwise. But the, the option is now formally on the table if our renewal plan um, is approved by the planning board and the city council. And I want to be really clear that this plan does not actually say what's going to happen on that property. So it says we are going to launch a community process, but it doesn't say it's going to be 10 stories tall. It's going to be an office building. It's going to be residential. That, that is not settled. That is going to be settled through a community process. Um, but I, I think this is a really important first step. And for anyone who's interested in this, I would really recommend reaching out to Ward 4 City Councilor Jesse Klingen, who has really been kind of uh, deeply involved in the community organizing around this. So more to come on big development, big uh, parcel development like that. I mean, this is where we can really hopefully make some kind of an impact with some affordable housing component as part of that redevelopment. Ben, I don't want to, I love the, these discussions, but I want to give you enough time to talk about the Somerville Cares Fund and the report that you may have on that one, because we are running down a little bit. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, so the Somerville Cares Fund was set up by the city as a, a, a charitable fund to for people to donate to and that money would go out to, to directly help people in Somerville. Um, we uh, received a report from the, the Community Action Agency of Somerville as a nonprofit that administered the, that money. 
And they, they made a public report, two public reports over the summer that, that talked about their experience. And they, they let us know that um, the fund raised almost $700,000, all of which has now been spent. Um, they have helped uh, more than 3,000 people in Somerville. And they, they learned a lot about these folks through this process. 70% of the people who got this money have lost more than half their income since March during the pandemic. Uh, one thing that's very important to recognize also is that the majority of these folks uh, prefer to speak a language other than English, and they haven't been able to access state or federal uh, assistance. So you can kind of infer from that that many of these folks are probably immigrants. And the, the level of hardship that they're facing in this pandemic is really kind of unspeakable. Um, so the reason I think it's really important to talk about this report is for one, to encourage everyone to Google Somerville Cares and continue to donate. The only reason we have money in that is because of generous donors. Um, but I also think it's important for all of us in local government um, to avoid sliding back into a, a new normal here in Somerville, um, to think that things are going okay. You know, I, I do believe that there are a lot of folks in Somerville who, um, despite all the hardships that we're going through, you know, their basic survival level economics have not been affected, but there are thousands of family in Somerville where that is really not the case and where the situation is much more desperate. And I just, I, I think it's important that every time we're in public and every time we are making decisions uh, in local government, we remember to keep our priorities straight. Um, this is not a business as usual period in Somerville history. We need to make sure you know, this is a back to basics moment. People need to have access to food, to shelter, to healthcare. This day and age, people need access to the internet. There's, there's so much of the benefits and the information that's coming out right now requires the internet. So I think as we, uh, as we continue to get through this together, we really need to keep our priorities straight and stay focused on that. And so for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, I, I would just recommend Googling Somerville Cares report. And you'll find these two reports. There were some news articles about them. They're, they're very um, sobering. Thank you, Ben. And, and, you know, just so people understand how it's being administered, um, you know, along with our local agency of CAS, um, the United Way of Mass Bay is also assisting in the administration of this and who gets what, how the money is doled out. Um, but as Ben Ewan-Campen says, you know, they raised $659,000 for assistance for such things as food and rental assistance. Um, and that money is gone. So where do these folks go into the future? So anything you can do. I know that we did have a couple of um, larger uh, corporate partners in that, like at McCall kind of stepped up uh, for a little bit. Um, but you know, Ben, the further we go on into this pandemic, the more critical it's gonna be for assistance to people whether that's public assistance or private donations or me and you kicking in 10 bucks, 30 bucks, wherever we can. Ben, unfortunately, we are out of time. I wanna thank you for coming back to Somerville Media Center Live for the City Council update. As always, please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time, Ben.